Hi, I'm Matt Ozalis, an RF engineer at Keysight. This video is going to be about how to design a stable high frequency amplifier. It's actually the second video in the series. The objective for today is going to be to review some basic concepts about stability that most engineers typically learn in their undergraduate studies. And hopefully this can provide a foundation that you'll need to better understand some of the more advanced topics that we're going to cover in some of the later videos. Today we'll talk about loop gain, we'll talk about Laplace transform, Cauchy's principle, and Nyquist plots. Just one note here, this is intended to be a very brief review for those who have already studied the concepts in school or on their own time. You can download the workspace that I'm showing today at the link underneath this video. One workspace is used for all the videos. Okay, so in the last video, I stated that instability fundamentally derives from a combination of gain and feedback. If you open a College Circuits textbook, you'll probably find a picture which looks something like this, describing a closed-loop feedback system. And you can do the math, it's pretty straightforward. I thought I'd make it explicit here, but ultimately we derive the output over the input, and that's the transfer function. And in the denominator of this transfer function, there's a term which multiplies the gain and the feedback, that's called the loop gain. And when that equals one, the denominator equals zero. And when that happens, the overall transfer function then goes to infinity. So this is the exact mechanism that creates an instability. Let's look at why this creates an oscillation. And to do that, we'll end up taking a tour of the feedback loop. So a signal comes in for the first time and it goes through the amplifier, which does two things. It increases the size of the signal and it also introduces some phase shift, as in there's a delay for the signal to get through the amplifier. Next, the signal goes through the feedback loop and it might get attenuated a little bit, but it also, importantly, encounters more delay. And if that delay is set up just right, the signal coming back through the feedback network adds constructively with the input signal, they're in phase, and then that creates a larger signal. And then it travels again through the amplifier and gets bigger. And that bigger signal also comes back around to the input and again adds constructively in phase with the signal. And this is the loop that happens before too long, of course, the signal becomes infinite. Now, I feel obligated to point out that this is, of course, an idealization. It's a mental model for thinking about oscillation. It doesn't always happen so clearly or so obviously in real life like most things, but I think it does paint a nice simple picture of how gain and feedback work. We can also look at this in the simulator. Here I have an amplifier and a feedback block in an ADS, and I will run a transient simulation at some carefully selected frequency, and you can see uh, for the res results in the data display that the feedback appears in phase with the input. So now uh, I'll go back to the, sim the schematic and I'll connect a, um, the feedback to the input of the amplifier. This is really closing the loop and you can probably guess what will happen when I rerun the transient analysis. Basically, the signal grows exponentially large, so the circuit's oscillating. And if I ran this out more in time, the, the growing nature uh, of this signal would ultimately cause the transient simulation to fail to converge. Okay, let's look more analytically into why the growth is exponential. If you look at the loop transfer function, this is actually an estimate equation, which means it's a representation of a system where the signals are passed through the Laplace transform. And this is the definition of the Laplace transform as well, just for review. Uh, one way to look at the S domain is a representation of frequency as opposed to time. Remember that S equals J omega. And you might also remember a few common transforms. A uh, constant in time results in, of course, a division in S. And an exponential in time maps to a 1 over S minus some constant in the S domain. As you probably know, there's big tables of Laplace transform mappings. Uh, anyway, any S domain equation can be factored into its roots both in the numerator and the denominator. These are, of course, called zeros and poles. And for the poles, we can use a technique called partial fraction expansion to actually factor them into terms that will map to a combination of exponential functions in the time domain. With exponentials, they can either grow or shrink depending on the sign of the exponent. So if the exponent's negative, they shrink, of course, and if it's positive, they grow. And ultimately, we can map that behavior back to the sign of the real part of the pole in the S domain. If the real part of the pole is negative, the exponent shrinks, and if it's positive, the exponent grows. So typically this is mapped by plotting real versus imaginary S and marking the poles on that plane. If the poles are in the left half, the system's stable. And if the poles are in the right half of the plane, the system's unstable. 
So if you're an amplifier designer, you dread the right half plane and you want to avoid it at all costs. If you're designing an oscillator though, it turns out to be pretty good real estate. Okay, the problem here is that you don't always get a nice mathematical expression like this for the poles and zeros. So you can't always just check the sign of the poles, for example. And in simulation, usually you get curves. You'll put a signal in and you get a signal out and that's the transfer function. So how do you learn about the poles and zeros in that case? Well, you can use something called Cauchy's principle, the derivation of which is beyond this video, but basically what it says is if you sweep a closed contour in the S domain and you pass this as the input to your transfer function, then at the output, you can figure out the difference between zeros and poles inside that contour by observing the number of times that the output encircles the origin clockwise. Picture is worth a thousand words here. Um, you take a contour, inside are four zeros and two poles. These are part of the transfer function. And if you pass it through the transfer function, at the output, it encircles the origin twice clockwise. And conversely, if there are more poles and zeros, of course, the encirclements are counterclockwise. In the amplifier feedback paradigm, we were interested in knowing the right half plane poles. The trick is finding a contour then that encompasses the entire right half plane. And you can do that using some mathematical gymnastics by essentially sweeping frequency from minus infinity to infinity, and that turns out to contour the whole right half plane through a connection of the infinity points. I don't have nearly enough time to get into that today, but the takeaway really is you can sweep frequency from zero to infinity and put that through your transfer function, and you can infer the negative frequencies as the complex conjugate, and you get the entire right half plane. Now in the transfer function, what we really want to know is when does that denominator go to zero? Because that's a pole that maps to an exponent in time. Instead of looking at the closed loop system, we could instead look essentially at the open loop system by observing the denominator, or really the combined gain and feedback terms. And if somehow we know that these have no right half plane poles, then it's possible to compute the right half plane zeros by simply sweeping frequency and observing the response, and counting how many times it circles zero. Or just to make it really confusing, uh, some folks out there like to look at just the AF term and count how many encirclements of one there are instead of zero. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. Probably the biggest question is, how do you know there are no right half plane poles in the amplifier times feedback term? And the answer is, for some given set of random blocks, you don't know there are zero right half plane poles. You can to some degree infer that from the stability of the individual blocks themselves, but that involves assumptions which may not always hold up. Uh, later on when we explore more rigorous computations like NDF, this will come back up, and as you'll see, the best functions out there are going to use a specific method to ensure that there are no unstable poles in this denominator term. But for now though, let's move forward with the big leap of faith that there are no unstable poles, and so the encirclements we get through the transfer function represent the right half plane zeros. Okay, going back to the simulation from earlier, instead of a time domain simulation, I can run a frequency domain simulation, that's an AC analysis, and I can run that through the cascaded gain and feedback blocks and do a log sweep across a really big frequency range. And at the output, if I analyze the return value and plot it on a polar plot, you can see a clockwise circle around one, and that happens at the point where the transient simulation showed that exponential growth. And I should really also, uh, in this case, plot the conjugate too to get the complex uh, right half plane and the, the, actually the complete um, one from negative infinity to infinity. Although, particularly for high frequency amplifiers, this isn't always quite as important as it usually is for like an op amp design. All right, so that covers the basics. Remember, you can download the workspace that I'm using at the link below the video. And if you want to get updates on the video series, please subscribe to our channel. We learned a little about loop gain today. Next up is loop gain techniques. That's video number three in the series. I'll see you then.